part two of Divinity Unveiled. Uh, today we're going to look at the word of Yah. And I don't mean the written word, I mean the word as an agency. Um, let's quickly recap a little bit from last week so we know where we're at. Last week we looked at the messenger of Yah and how the scriptures imply that the messenger of Yah is Yah. They're interchangeable. There was a lot of blurring going on. Like one minute it's the messenger, one minute it's Yah himself. What's going on? And we covered that pretty in depth last week. We looked at the words of our Messiah, that no one has heard Elohim's voice at any time, nor seen his form. We also agreed that no one threw their hands up in the air and shouted heretic at him. So clearly other people agreed with that. And obviously that was problematic, you know, because we had Abraham hanging out with Yah. You know, everybody seemed to be seeing Yah, hearing his voice. Moses, the 70 elders, Mount Sinai. I mean, they saw his feet, right? We saw how this can be problematic because there's no shortage of those who had spoken with and or seen Elohim. We briefly looked at how even the ancient rabbis spoke of Elohim appearing as a man. We looked at this idea that modern Judaism says that Elohim is incorporeal, no body, cannot be assigned any physical properties. And we saw that actually that really wasn't the case in the first century. There was a bit of um and ahhing going on. Today, we will look at the word of Yah. We, we finished last week with this passage. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. All came to be through him, and without him, not even one came to be that came to be. Now, what does this even mean, right? We, we quote it all the time. And people just kind of reel it off almost like a mantra and don't actually stop and think, what does this mean? So what nationality was John? He was, he was Jewish, right? So therefore, what would this have meant to a first century Jew? John is writing in a particular time period. He's got lots of paradigms that he's pulling in from. So it's one thing saying, what does this mean to us? But what did it actually mean to the writer? Because really, this is what we want to know. We read throughout scripture of when the word of Yah came to, I don't know, Jeremiah. You read this, and the word of Yah came to me, or Samuel, or Isaiah. Or you'll find this in the Tanakh, especially in the prophets, and the word of Yah came to me, saying. In modern Christianese, this implies that someone received the word. So um, for those of you that have come from more Pentecostal backgrounds or interacted with that, You'll get this thing of, um, oh, the Father's given me a word and I must tell you the word that he's given me to tell you. And this is how we read this, especially like when, Isaiah, when the word of Yah came to Isaiah, we just think of it that he was kind of like in this trance and suddenly he was just speaking all this stuff. However, this was not actually the understanding of the Hebrews, as we're going to cover today. Let's put things back into context. Let's see how these people would have understood these phrases. The following are quotes from a Jewish encyclopedia, the Jewish. So this is not even messianic. Um, the word, in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God, manifesting his power in the world of matter or mind. So in English, basically, Yah interacting with creation, in, with physical. Yah's eternal, this is him interacting with the physical. A term used, especially in the Targum, is a substitute for the Lord, when an anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. Remember from the tail end of last week, the, the, the status quo of Jewish thinking, Yah cannot have a body. So all these passages in the scripture, as we'll cover, where we see anthropomorphisms happen, that was the word. It's Yah manifesting himself. It's him, but it's not him, fully him, if that makes sense. In scripture, the word of the Lord commonly denotes the speech addressed to patriarch or prophet, as I've just mentioned, and the word of Yah came, saying, but frequently it denotes also the creative word. So when something creative would happen, that was done through his word. For example, 
In Psalm 33, this is from our, you know, the ISR version. By the word of Yah, the heavens were made, and all their host by the spirit of his mouth. Interesting. The word, the spirit kind of being merged together. Gathering the waters of the sea together as a heap, laying up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yah. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood fast. So this would be an idea, uh, an example of the creative properties of his word. The word heard and announced by the prophet often became in the conception of the seer an efficacious power apart from God as was the angel or the messenger of God. So efficacious that it's working and it's doing something and succeeding is the sort of idea. And notice that this was, it was apart from God, but yet it was him. In the Targum, the Memra, Memra is the Aramaic for the word, the Devar. The Memra figures constantly as the manifestation of the divine power, or as God's messenger in place of God himself, wherever the predicate is not in conformity with the dignity or the spirituality of the deity. So basically, again, this idea... Yah himself cannot come into corporeal fashion, therefore it's his word. This is how they get around it, basically. Like the Shekhinah, the Memra, the word, is accordingly the manifestation of God. This is how Judaism understands this topic. Notice, it's not something else, it's not another personality, it's God manifesting. We'll get more in-depth with this. Let's begin to look at how the word was understood by first-century believers, right? We want to get back to the faith of Messiah and the disciples. So how did they understand it? Not how modern Judaism understands it, not how Christianity understands it. Remember, both sides of the river have their own stuff to deal with. To do this, we'll compare scripture with the Targums. The Targums were Aramaic translations of the original Tanakh. We covered this, that uh, when they came out of Babylon, the, Jew, the Jews, um, a lot of them started speaking Aramaic, and some, some of them didn't speak Hebrew. Um, so in the synagogue, you would have people that spoke Hebrew and those who spoke Aramaic. So for everyone to understand, the Hebrew scriptures would be read out, and then another person would translate into Aramaic. These often added little embellishments that help us understand how those translating the Tanakh understood certain verses. You'll find that in the various Targums, um, that they insert not so much their bias, but their understanding of it. That they add their interpretation to certain verses, which is interesting. These were read aloud in the synagogues, which means they were sanctioned and licensed by the religious authority. So it wasn't, you, you couldn't just pick any old Tom, Dick and Harry off the street and say, can you translate for me? There were people specifically trained for this, they, they, were, they would have arguably been rabbis that spoke both languages and they would have been sanctioned by the religious authority. This means that the first century believers would have been very well acquainted with the Targums and their contents. Very well acquainted. Just so people understand as well, uh, Aramaic and Hebrew use the same script. And they're, they're very, very similar. Very similar. The Targums we'll be looking at today are the Targum of Jonathan ben Uziel and the Jerusalem Targum. Now, let, let's have a little thing about Jonathan, see who he was. Jonathan ben Uziah was one of the 80 Tanaims that studied under Hillel the Elder during the time of Roman ruled Judea. Do you remember last week I showed that little thing of the chart of all the uh, rabbinic ages? This was the first one, or the second, sorry. And the Tanaim were from 0 AD to 200 AD. Now, Hillel the Elder lived like 110 BC, I think. Hang on. I think I'm... I'm anyway... Uh, Jonathan ben Uziah was Hillel's most distinguished pupil. Of the 80 he taught, Jonathan ben Uziah was top of the class. Hillel the Elder lived from 110 BC to 10 AD, 
and set up the school of Hillel for Tanaim. Now in Yeshua's day, you had the, the school of Hillel versus the school of Shammai. And these two bickered and fought all the time. You actually catch wind of this in some of the Gospels, if you know what you're looking for. This makes Jonathan ben Uziel a contemporary of Yeshua. Yeshua would have known who this guy was. He, was the, he would have been arguably the authority on Targums of the day. Yeah, it's a long time for someone of that age. Jonathan ben Uziel is held by the Jews in the highest esteem. I mean, he's basically one down from Moses in their thinking. His paraphrases are considered as by the synagogue as inspired. So, very much how we consider the New Testament to be part of canon, part of scripture. You know, we, we agree that Yeshua's disciples had the Spirit upon them, therefore what they say must be inspired by the Spirit, right? This is how the Jews viewed ben, Jonathan ben Uziel and his Targum. It was scripture. The synagogue maintains that the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi gave Jonathan ben Uziel the paraphrase written upon a scroll over his head. It's interesting. Nice little story they've got going there. We read in the Talmud, Jonathan ben Uziel was worthy of the Shekhinah which rested upon him as he did upon our teacher Moses. Now, what was it that rested upon Moses? The spirit. So the, the divine presence. So this is what the Jews are saying, that uh, Jonathan ben Uziel had the same spirit that Moses did. This is how high they regard it. So he's not just some guy. This guy had some clout. He was such a holy man that when he studied the law, the birds flying over him were burnt to death. <laughs> I, I, I love that. You know, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's, this is just a foundation so let's look, we're going to be doing a lot of comparison now we're going to compare Tanakh and we're going to compare it to Targum we're going to do a lot of that and Elohim created the man in his image in the image of Elohim he created him male and female he created them the Targum says and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness in his likeness in the likeness of the presence of the Lord. Notice the interplay. So the word of the Lord is considered the presence of the Lord. Not the presence of another person, it's his presence. Now, why? Again, because they use the word as a way to avoid Elohim, the ultimate divinity, to be anthropomorphized. He, cannot, he just cannot have a body. That's basically where this comes from. He created him, the male and his yoke fellow, he created them. Now in Isaiah 63, 9, we covered this last week. In all their distress, he was distressed. And the messenger of his presence saved them. So the word is considered the presence, as was the angel of Yah. Let's look at Genesis 2. And Yah Elohim planted a garden in Eden to the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The Targum says this, and a garden from the Eden of the just was planted by the word of the Lord God before the creation of the world, and he made there to dwell the man when he had created him. The word created man. Again, like one thing is that remember how a uh, uh, Hebrew thought that they were like very strict monotheistic, right? There's only Yah, nothing else. The word was an agency so that they could basically anthropomorphize him without bringing deity down. This, was, this is the logic. Genesis 3. And they heard the sound of Yah Elohim. Now, the, voice there is, the word there is kol, which means voice, actually. It says they heard the voice of Yah Elohim. The King James bring this out, brings this out, actually. Walking about in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yah Elohim. Notice that the voice of Yah is his presence from among the trees in the garden. And Yah Elohim called unto Adam and said to him, Where are you? This is how, oh. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. 
This is the way the Targum puts it. And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord walking in the garden. Again, Yah himself cannot be walking because that means he's got feet and legs. So they say the word of the Lord. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from before the Lord God. Please notice that the word of the Lord God is the same as the Lord God. And the word of the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Behold, the world which I have created is manifest before me. And how thinkest thou that the place in the midst whereof thou art is not revealed before me? Where is the commandment which I taught thee? See, you can see how they're starting to interpret a verse. And he said, The voice of thy word heard I in the garden. And I was afraid because I am naked. And the commandments which thou didst teach me, I have transgressed. Therefore I hid myself from shame. In Genesis 7, and they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. And those going in, male and female of all flesh, went in as Elohim had commanded him, and Yah shut him in. In the Targum it says, and they entered the, to, to Noah in the ark, into the ark, two of two of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. And they coming entered, male and female, of all flesh unto him, as the Lord had instructed him. And the word of the Lord covered the door of the ark upon the face thereof. And the word of the Lord God was merciful upon him. Remember, this is what's been preached from the synagogue. In the first century, as scripture. And Elohim said, This, chapter 9, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I shall remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Let's see what the Targum says. The Targum on this is amazing. And the Lord said, this is the sign of the covenant which I established between my word and between you. Every living soul that is with you unto the generations of the world changes things up just a little bit. I have, seen, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of the covenant between my word and the earth. And it shall be that when I spread forth my glorious cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the daytime while the sun is not sunk or hidden in a cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between my word and between you and every living soul of all flesh that there shall not be the waters of a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of the Lord God and every living soul of all flesh that is upon the earth. And the Lord said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have covenanted between my word and between the word, the word for all flesh that is upon the earth. It, it, uh, to me, this is amazing. And let's remember that they didn't just like pull this out of thin air all of a sudden in the first century these this was passed on generation to generation from disciple to disciplee i like this one tower of babel incident then yah came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and yah said look they are one people and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do and now they are not going to be withheld from doing whatever they plan to do come let us go there and confuse their language so that they do not understand one another's speech now trinitarians love verse 7 see there's a plurality between within god and yah scattered them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off the building they left off building the city. Now the Targum is really interesting. And the Lord God, the Lord was revealed to punish them for the work of the city and the tower which the sons of men had builded. Now 
this rendition is interesting and it, as it shows their bias in regard to what Elohim can and can't do. This is what the Torah actually says. Then Yah came down. And basically they're like, oh no, Elohim cannot come down, so he, he's revealed. You know, they, they were embarrassed by it almost. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and the language of all of them one, and this they have thought to do, and now they will not be restrained from doing whatever they imagine. And the Lord said to the seventy angels which stand before him, Come, we will descend, and we will, we will there commingle their language, that a man shall not understand the speech of his neighbor. That's, so this is the idea of the divine counsel. Now, let's remember... There was no such concept of a trinity back then. This is, we're still in monotheistic times. This would have been preached before Yeshua was on the earth. And the understanding that this, this was nothing to do with plurality in the, in the Godhead. This was to do with Yah and his angels, his divine counsel. That, that this is where the plurality comes from. Well, yeah, 70 for the 70 nations. And the word of the Lord was revealed against the city. And with him, 70 angels, having reference to 70 nations, each having its own language, and thence the writing of its own hand. Which is interesting, because what did we read? Verse, the Lord was revealed. When they put the Lord, this is the Tetragrammaton, you know, Yehovah, there. So whenever you see that, it's that substitution. It says that Yah was revealed, but here, it says that the word of the Lord was revealed. Again, the word and Yah himself are being used interchangeably. And he dispersed them from thence upon the face of all the earth into 70 languages. And one knew not what his neighbor would say, but one slew the other and they ceased from building the city. You, you can see where they add in little bits, like their own understanding. Okay, let's look at the, when Yah made the, the covenant, right, with Avraham, the father of the faith. This is what the Torah says. After these events, the word of Yah came to Avraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Avraham. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. And Avraham said, Master Yah, what would you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Avram said, See, you have given me no seed, and see, one born in my house is my heir. And see, the word of Yah came to him. So see, already in Torah, we have this idea of the word coming to Avram, saying, This one is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. And he brought him outside. See, look, look people, just to kind of get the... Uh, the charismatic and more Pentecostals would say, oh, Avram was just sitting here and the words came to him in his head. And they'll say that because this is what people quote-unquote experience themselves. So they, take, they, they try and justify their experience. How does the word of Yah coming to Avraham then take him outside? Brings you outside. Think of that. We read right over this. And said, look now towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so are your seed. And he believed in Yah and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. Let's see what the Targum has to say. Thereupon was the word of the Lord with Avram in a vision, saying, fear not, for if these men would gather together in legions and come against thee, my word will be thy shield. My word will be thy shield. In the, what we read in the Torah said that I will be your shield. And Avram said, Lord God, great blessings thou hast given me, and great are they which it is before thee to give me. Nevertheless, what, profits, what profit is it to me when I pass from the world without children, and Eliezer, the manager of my house, by whose hands signs were wrought for me in Damascus, expects to be my heir? And Avram said, Behold, to me thou hast given me not given a son, and behold, the manager of my house will be my heir. And behold, a word from before the Lord was to him, saying, He shall not be thine heir, but a son whom thou wilt beget shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth without, and said, Look up now to the heavens, and number the stars, if thou art able to number them. And he said, So will be thy sons. 
And he believed in the Lord and had faith in the word of the Lord. And he reckoned it to him for righteousness because he parlayed not with him before with words. He didn't argue. He just accepted it. So the first century understanding was that it was the word of Yah that made the covenant with Avraham. Which, uh, let's keep going. By the way, I've only picked out like the key events. Like, if you read the Targums, it's everywhere. I mean, I had to very, be very selective of which text to use. We covered this last week, but I want to bring it up again. The messenger of Yah said to her, See, you are conceiving and bearing a son, and you shall call his name Yishmael, before, because Yah has heard your affliction. And he is to be a wild man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, to dwell over against all his brothers. And she called the name of Yah who spoke to her, You are the El who sees. For she said, Even here have I seen, him, seen after him who sees me. Now, the Targum translates verse 13 very interestingly and she gave thanks before the Lord whose word spake to her now we've just read it was the messenger of Yah speaking with Hagar and the Targum is saying actually it was the word and thus said thou art he who livest and art eternal who seest but are not seen that but are not seen is them adding in their little thing for she said, For behold, here is revealed the glory of the Shekhinah of the Lord after a vision. So the word, the angel, the Shekhinah, all interchangeable, according to first century and before. The messenger of Yah is equated to the word as well as the Shekhinah, the visible presence of Elohim. That's the key there, the visible presence of Elohim. Genesis 17, and it came to be when Avraham was 99 years old that Yah appeared to Avraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. I, and I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Avraham fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant is with you and you shall become the father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Avram, but your name shall be Avraham, because I shall make you a father of many nations. And I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly, and make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come forth from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be Elohim to you and your seed after you. This is my covenant, which you are to guard between me and you, and your seed after you. Every male among you is to be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you. Let's look at the target. Avram was the son of 99 years, and the Lord appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, serve before me and be perfect in thy flesh. And I will set my covenant between my word and thee, and will multiply thee very greatly. And the Lord spake with him, and saying, Behold, I have confirmed my covenant with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many peoples. And thy name shall no longer be called Avram, but Avraham shall be thy name, because to be the father of great multitude of peoples have I appointed thee. And I have established my covenant between my word and thee, and thy sons after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God to thee and to thy sons forever. So it, 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 whose covenant is it? Is it the covenant of the word? Uh, and now he's saying that I will be a God to thee in your seed. This is my covenant that you shall observe between my word and you. And your sons after you, every male of you being circumcised, though he have not a father to circumcise him. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between my word and you. Is that interesting so far? Just how the ancients would have heard scripture. This one is good even just in our translation. And Yah rained sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yah out of the heavens. So it's like uh, Trinitarians will go there as well. See, there's two Yahs. So he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. 
Now the Targum is interesting. It says, the word of the Lord himself made to descend upon the people of Sodom and Amorah showers of favor that they might work repentance from their wicked works. But when they saw the showers of favor, they said, so our wicked works are not manifest before him. So in their understanding, the people were trying to spite Yah to his face. He turned then and caused to descend upon them bitumen and fire from before the Lord from the heavens. And he, he, who, who's the he? The word of the Lord himself. He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and the herbage of the earth. So th this is how they got around this. There's not two yards, it's Yah and his word. And Elohim remembered Rachel. And Elohim listened to her and opened her womb. This is when Rachel and Leah are fighting over who's got the most sons. And she conceived and bore a son and said, Elohim has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Yosef and they said, Yah has added to me another son. Targum says, the word of the Lord remembered Rachel in his good compassions. And the word of the Lord heard the voice of her prayer. And he said in his word that he would, be, that he would give her children. So we, see, we, we hear that the word of the Lord is the mediator of prayer here. It was the word that heard the prayer and the word that acted upon it. This should remind us of our high priest, right? Who's our mediator. Okay, you get the idea. I'm going to stop comparing so much and we're going to go straight to the Targums. And Deborah, the nurse of Rivka, died and was buried below Betel under an oak. And he called the name of it the Oak of Weeping. And now what happens is that they add in like this whole diatribe. Like it's almost like a little miniature sermonette that they've added into the Targum. The God of eternity, whose name be blessed forever and ever, hath taught us precepts which are beautiful and statutes that are comely. He has taught us the blessing of matrimony from Adam and his bride, as the scripture expoundeth, and the word of the Lord blessed them. And the word of the Lord said to them, be strong and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now, if you read the Torah version of this, it says, an Elohim blessed them. And Elohim said to them, bear fruits and increase and fill the earth and subdue it. Interesting. He hath taught us to visit the afflicted from our father Abraham, the righteous, when he revealed himself in the plain of vision and gave him the precept of circumcision and made him to sit in the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Remember, this is, we've just covered what the Targums said about this. As the scripture expounded and said, the word of the Lord revealed to himself in, in the plain of vision. And again, he hath taught us to bless those who mourn from our father Jacob, the righteous, the righteous, for he revealed himself to him on his coming from Padan of Aram, and the way of the world had happened to Deborah, the nurse of Rivka, his mother, and Rachel died by him in the way. And Jacob, our father, sat weeping and bewailing her and mourning and crying. Then wast thou, O Lord of all worlds, in the perfection of thy free mercies revealed to him, and didst comfort him, and blessing the mourners didst bless him concerning his mother, even as the scripture expoundeth and says, the word of the Lord revealed himself unto Jacob the second time on his coming from Padan Aram and blessed him. Now if you look at the original, it says Yah. And it doesn't say he revealed, it says Yah came to him. So, and they're saying that this, the word of the Lord revealing, this is scripture. Exodus 12. And it came to be at midnight that Yah smote all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. Targum says this, it was in the dividing of the night of the 15th that the word of the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, and so forth. The word did this. Remember how uh, in, earlier on, the word was seen as an efficacious power. In the Targum, it was the word that plagues Egypt. I'm not going to go, we're not going through all of them, but every time it's the word Interestingly, it was the word that plagues the people of Israel at the golden calf. 
It says this, the word of the Lord plagued the people because they had bowed themselves to the calf that Aharon had made. Kind of, um, it changes our perception of the word, right? You know, when, when uh, people who accept Messiah as their, uh, Yeshua as their Messiah, and say, okay, Yeshua is the word, all of a sudden, Yeshua is not just this, you know, hippie flower fairy, right? He, he, <laughs> the word of the Lord plagued the people. He was the one that did all the judgments upon Egypt. It was the word that led them out of Egypt and redeemed them. Go look it up for yourself. It was his word that redeemed the people. Which means that a future redemption from his word would only be cyclical and not a new thing. This cannot actually be understated enough. His word redeemed them. Let's keep going. You have seen what vengeance, this is when Yah gives the, the covenant uh, to Israel. What vengeance I have taken of the Mizraim, how I bear you upon the light clouds as upon eagle's wings, and brought you nigh to the doctrine of my law. And now if you will truly hearken the voice of my word. <laughs> you know, what, one thing I realize is that people are very quick to say, well, his word is speaking about his written word. But too many times the word is personified, as in like an actual thing. The voice of my word, so the written word now speaks. Huh, the living word. Huh? And will keep my covenant. So the voice of my word and will keep my covenant. You shall be unto my name a distinct people and beloved as a precious treasure above all peoples. For all the earth is to the name of the Lord. And to my name you shall be kings and priests and a holy people. That's interesting because it says you shall be priests and kings unto me in the Torah. But here it says unto my name. And the word of the Lord said to Moshe, Behold, my word will be revealed to thee in the thickness of the cloud. Now we know, we know that it says Yah descends upon Mount Sinai. It's the word. I'm going to reveal my word to thee in the thickness of the cloud that the people may hear while I speak with thee and may also believe forever in the words of the prophecy of thee, my servant Moshe. And the Lord said to Moshe on the fourth day, go unto the people and prepare them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their raiment and be prepared on the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will reveal himself. This is literally the next verse. So he says, my word will be revealed. Now he says that the Lord will reveal himself to the eyes of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And it was on the third day, the sixth of the month, in the time of the morning, that the mountain there were voices and thunders and lightnings and mighty clouds of smoke and a voice of a trumpet exceeding loud and all the people in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought forth the people from the camp to meet the glorious presence of the Lord. And suddenly the Lord of all the world all the world uprooted the mountain, lifted it in the air, and it became luminous as a beacon, and they stood beneath the mountain. So they're embellishing it a bit. But we've just read that, that he will reveal himself his word to them, then he will reveal himself, and now they're meeting the glorious presence of the Lord. It's just it's all interchangeable. The Targum of Jonathan, that, like, remember there's two Targums of Jerusalem and Jonathan. All the Mount of Sinai was in flame, for the heavens had overspread it, and he was revealed over it in a flaming fire, and smoke went up as the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain quaked greatly. Now the Targum of Jerusalem says, all the Mount Sinai went up in smoke because the glory of the Shekhinah of the Lord was revealed upon it in a flame of fire. So in, in the first centuries and the centuries leading up to it, Shekhinah, word, presence, angel, all synonymous, used interchangeably. Again, we see that the word of Elohim and his Shekhinah are one and the same. The problem is that Kabbalah's done a wonderful job of uh, completely changing what the Shekhinah is. This also is equated to his presence. Again, in all their distress, he was distressed, and the messenger of his presence saved them. Where, they're not pulling these concepts out of thin air. They're obviously seeing scripture and connecting dots together. And the word of the Lord spake all these excellency of these words. The Ten Commandments was given by the word. 
Son of Israel, my people, I am the Lord your God. Hang on a minute. The word of the Lord is saying this. Now is I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land from the land of Mizraim from the house of bondage and slaves. Again, this passage cannot be understated enough. The word is Yah. Yeah. Exodus 25. This is Yah speaking to Moses. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, upon the ark, and within the ark thou shalt lay the tables of the testament that I will give thee. And I will appoint my word with thee there. And I will speak with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testament, concerning all that I may command thee for, for the sons of Israel. This tells us that it was the word that spoke to Moses. Go read the, the, the Torah equivalent. It says Yah, and Yah spoke. And the Lord spake with Moshe, saying, Also speak thou with the sons of Israel, saying, Ye shall keep the day of my Sabbaths indeed, for it is a sign between my word and you, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctify you. So now that the, the Moedim are a covenant between the people and the word of Yah. I love it. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy to you. Whosoever profaneth it shall die. Dying he shall die. Whoso doeth work therein, that man shall be destroyed from his people. The sons of Israel shall therefore keep the Sabbath to perform the delightful exercises of the Sabbath. It is for your generations an everlasting statue between my word and the sons of Israel. It is a sign forever. Look, I love that. To perform the delightful exercises of the Sabbath. They're, they're, they're drawing upon Isaiah uh, 56 or 58. Whoever, who, the foreigner that comes in and says the Sabbath is a delight. This is amazing. Then he said, show now unto me thy glory. But he said, behold, I will make all the measure of my goodness pass before thee, and I will give utterance in the good name of the word of the Lord before thee. And I will get, have compassion upon whom I see it right to have compassion, and will be merciful to whom I see it right to have mercy. Pardon? Exactly. If you read it, it says, I shall, in the Torah it says, I shall proclaim my name unto thee. And the Lord said, Behold, a place is prepared before me, and thou shalt stand upon the rock. And it shall be that when the glory of my Shekhinah passes before thee, I will put thee in the cavern of the rock, and will overshadow thee with my word, until the time that I have passed by. I mean, this is amazing. Please don't tell me that when it says the word, it's talking about written words on a piece of paper. My word will overshadow thee. This should hearken us back to Noah, that it was the word that sealed the ark. To me, it's, I love this. I was like, you know when you, you have that moment and you're just shaking with excitement? That's what, that was me reading this. <laughs> Again, let's remember this from the Jewish perspective. The word in the sense of the creator of a directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter and mind. This is Yah appearing in our thing, our existence. A term used especially in the Targums as a substitute for the Lord when anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. The memory of figures constantly as the manifestation of divine power. This is not something separate. It's Yah manifesting himself. Like the Shekhinah, the Memra is accordingly the manifestation of God. Not a second person, not a third person. Let's stop here. I know it's a lot to take in. What I did, I wanted to show you the key moments in Scripture, the giving of the covenant, uh, making of the covenant with Abraham, creation, who did Moses speak with? The giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Who was it that Moses saw? I'm trying to give you this from the first century perspective. In part two, we're going to look a bit at Isaiah, and then we're going to tie it to, uh, I'm going to make a statement. I hope that's been a blessing so far. Right, so 
In part one, we basically covered the main key moments in the Torah to do with the word. We're going to briefly touch upon about what Yeshayahu, Isaiah, had to say, and then we'll move forward. So the word so far, the instance of the word that I have shown here, but literally a small fraction of what is in the rest of the Targums. In your own time, read the Targum. I really struggled to keep this down for the time. It would seem that every time Elohim interacted with his creation, he did so through his word. Or we, as we covered last week, the messenger. His word is equated to the messenger of Yah, to the Shekhinah, and to his presence. All interchangeable in the first century mindset. Let's continue our search and see how the prophet Isaiah speaks of the word of Yah. I mean, already, if you read just the, what you get in the standard translation, the word shows up a lot anyway. But let's see what the Targums had to say. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my word hates. They are an abomination before me. I have often forgiven you. If you read it, it says, my being hates your new moons and your, and your appointed times. When your priests are spreading out their hands to pray for you, I shall make to ascend the presence of my Shekhinah from you. He shall take his presence away. And when you are multiplying prayer, it is not my pleasure to accept your prayer at your hands, they being full of the blood of the innocent. Interesting. Return to the law, make you clean, make you clean from your sins. Put away the evil of your doings from before the presence of my word. Cease to do evil. It's very interesting terminology. And they use this because man cannot be in the presence of Yah and live. So you're in the presence of his word. Again, don't tell me the word is just this written thing. It's, yeah. Isaiah 5. Woe unto them that are, mi that are mighty to drink wine and mighty lords of riches to make themselves drunk with old wine who justify the guilty in order to receive from him the mammon of falsehood, the, the pleasures, the money, the, the gain, and wickedly take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore they shall be devoured as stubble in the fire and like dry hay in the flame. They are multiplying their strength, it shall be an ulcer, and the money of their oppression is the dust that flieth away, because they have despised the law of the Lord of hosts and rejected the word the Holy One of Israel. This is huge. The word is equated to the Holy One of Israel. That title is reserved to divinity alone. This is where Isaiah sees the glory, right? He sees Yah sat on the throne. In the year which King Isaiah was smitten with the leprosy, the prophet said, I saw the glory of the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up unto the highest heavens, and the temple was filled with the brightness of his glory. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, Whom shall I send to prophesy, and who will go teach? Then I said, I, here I am, send me. I just find that interesting. He sees Yah himself, and then it's the word that spoke. And there shall be the Lord, the light of Israel, and his holy one, his word. That's really interesting phraseology. His holy one, his word. This has got the messianic implication now. Strong as fire and his word is a flame and it shall slay and make an end of his rulers and of his governors in one day. And it shall consume the glory of the multitude of his army. This is speaking of, I think, of one of the nations that was around Israel. Um, and their souls with their bodies and he shall be broken and be a fugitive. And the rest of his warriors shall come to an end that the people shall be a small number and they shall be reckoned a weak kingdom. And it shall come to pass that in time that the remnant of Israel and such are the escaped of the house of Yaakov shall no more again lean on the people whom they served, but they shall lean upon the word of the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. Again, the word of Yah is equated to the Holy One of Israel. This is huge, 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 huge. Remember that the people speaking this were strictly monotheistic. 
You know, they, they, these people were reciting the Shema three times a day. Isaiah 12. See, El is my. So this is our version. See, El is my deliverance. I trust and I'm not afraid. For Yah, Yehovah, is my strength and my song, and he has become my deliverance. And you shall draw water with joy from the fountains of deliverance. It says the fountains of Yeshua there in the Hebrew. The Targum says, Behold, in the word of God is my salvation. In the word of God is my salvation. I am trusting and shall not be moved because my strength and my praise is the fear of the Lord. He hath spoken by his word and he is become my savior. So so the word of Yah is his salvation, but Yah himself has become my salvation. And I love this. And ye shall receive a new doctrine with joy from the chosen of the righteous. This is this messianic understanding of, you know, the Torah shall go forth from Zion. I love this. It's just amazing. Isaiah 17, again, let's compare. In that day, man shall look to his maker and his eyes turn to the set apart one of Yisrael. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, and he shall not see that which his own fingers made, nor the Asherim, nor the sun pillars. The Targum says at that time, a man shall stay himself upon the service of his maker and his eyes shall hopefully look for the word, the Holy One of Israel. He shall not rest upon the altars, the work of his hands, or stay himself upon that which his fingers have prepared, neither upon the groves nor upon the sun images. Isaiah 21. That which I have heard from Yah of hosts, the Elohim of Yisrael, I have declared to you. It, it, it doesn't really matter what's going on. I'm trying to make a point here. And the rest of the number of archers, the mighty men of the people of Kedar, shall be few. For Yah Elohim of Yisrael has spoken. This is what the Targum says. The prophet said, the voice of the word of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, which I have heard, I have declared unto you. Look, the word of the Lord is equated to Yah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel. And the strength of the warriors, the mighty, the sons of the Arabians shall be lessened, because by the word of the Lord God, the God of Israel, it is thus decreed. Trust in Yah forever, for in Yah, Yehovah is a rock of ages. Targum says, trust ye in the word of the Lord forever and ever. Thus ye shall be saved by the word, who is the, fear, who, who is the fear of the Lord, the mighty one, to eternity. So pe- people, you can say, oh, well, you, you read the, the scriptures and they shall save you. Yeshua sure actually said something about that. He says, you, you go to back and forth in the scripture thinking they will give you life. The word is like, look, you can tick the box. Will that grant you access into the kingdom? Right? No, the word needs to become alive, written on your heart. But if you want to say, look, the, saved by the word, who, who, not which, is, who is the fear of the Lord, the mighty one to eternity, which is saying that the word is the mighty one to eternity. See, my servant whom I uphold, this is our version, my chosen one my being has delighted in, I have put my spirit upon him, he brings forth right ruling to the nations. Targum says, Behold my servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen in whom one delights. As for my word, I will put my Holy Spirit upon him. He shall reveal my judgment unto the nations. It gets better. The words in italic are actually inserted into the translation. They're inserted to make the English roll better. They're not actually in the Aramaic. So really it should read as such. Behold my servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen in whom delights, my word, I will put my spirit upon him. That's equating the Messiah to his word. Just stick to what the Aramaic says. Don't put in this English, you know, let's, this is where translation can change really the whole context. Oh, well, it sounds better in, in English. No, take it as it is. My servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen in whom I delight, my word, I will put my spirit upon him. He shall reveal my judgment. This is huge. 
Thus said Yah, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am Yah, doing all, stretching out the heavens all alone, spreading out the earth with none beside me. Now, Jewish people will throw this at the Trinitarians. There is none else. Yah himself says so. Thus saith the Lord, who hath redeemed thee, and who hath prepared thee from the wound, I am the Lord that maketh all things. I have suspended the heavens by my word. I have laid the foundations of the earth by my strength. So this idea that the word is the creative power. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. Yisrael shall be saved by Yah with an everlasting deliverance. You are not to be ashamed nor hurt forever or ever. It is I who have made the earth by my word and I have created man upon it. What did we read earlier, though, in part one? That it was the word that created man. It is I who have suspended the heavens by my power. I have laid the foundation of all the hosts of them. Israel shall be saved by the word of the Lord. With an everlasting salvation, ye shall be not ashamed nor confounded forever, yea, for ages after ages. Please remember, this is what's being spoken in the synagogue, even before Yeshua is walking on earth. And this was, they said, this is divine inspiration. Jonathan ben was the modern Moses, as it were. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am El, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself a word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return so that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue swear. The Targum says, turn unto my word and be ye saved. All that are at the ends of the earth, for I am the Lord, there is none else. I have sworn by my word. Look, swearing by his word is swearing by himself. The word has gone forth in righteousness from my presence and shall not fail that before me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. One shall say, only in Yah do I have righteousness and strength. He comes to him and all those displeased with him shall be put to shame. In Yah, all the seed of Yisrael shall be declared right and boast. Targum says, surely he has promised to bring me righteousness and strength by the word of the Lord. In his word they shall offer praise and all the nations that are incensed against his people shall be ashamed. In the word of the Lord, all the seed of Israel shall be justified and glorified. You get get the point I'm trying to make, right? I'm laboring this for a reason. I'm laboring it. I know I am. Again, these are it's literally like a small fraction. You can, these are readily available online, by the way. I can give you the website. Read it for yourself. I, I struggled to keep it down because there's so much amazing stuff. Again, this is the Targum of Jonathan Ben Uziel, not just some ragged-type guy on the street. His writings were considered inspired and were read aloud in the synagogue. This means that the people had no problem understanding that Elohim manifests himself through his word. The word was Yah, it was equated with Yah, and it was, i.e., his agent through whom he, he worked. Let's remember how the Jews, again, understood this concept. The word in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter or mind. The infinite coming into the created. The term used by the Targum as a substitute for the Lord. We've watched this. It was The word is Yah. In the Targum, the memory of figures constantly as the manifestation of the divine power Like the Shekinah, the memory is accordingly the manifestation of God. Elohim, infinite in nature and infinite in power, cannot fully manifest himself to a fallen world. Right? He says, I'm a consuming fire. You cannot see my face or you will die. Therefore, he manifests himself in a veiled or shrouded form. Does that make sense? He, He turns the heat down, so to speak. This is the messenger of Yah. We saw this last week. The messenger was equated to Yah. But clearly the messenger wasn't, you know, flooring people in glory. 
This is the word of Yah. Again, people, they, they fell down in respect, but they weren't like smitten, if that makes sense. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. Everything lines up, right? So far, nothing out of the ordinary. He was in the beginning with Elohim. Well, yeah, the word was created. Everything was created. Through, we, we've read that. All came to be through him, and without him, not even one came to be that came to be. We've read that. This is nothing new. To John right now is not saying anything new. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his esteem, esteem as of an only brought forth of a father complete in favor and truth. Now, that sentence has meaning. We really see what John was saying. Think about, this is part of, your, of the gospel of truth, right? The good news. The word became flesh. This is why I labored this. I want, these people were hearing this week in, week out. They grew up on it uh, since they came out the womb. And this is what they were hearing. So for you to hear it for an hour and a bit, I'm trying to, do you see the effect I'm going for? The word, that we, everything that we've just covered with the word, that word put on flesh. Now it's all the more powerful. It's not just this whimsical thing I've made up in my mind. There's an understanding behind this. John didn't say this out in a void. He didn't pluck it out of thin air. This is what Genesis says. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The Targum says this, in wisdom, the Lord created. Bechukma. In wisdom. Where is the Targumist getting this idea from? Because obviously, remember, this is inspired, right? This is scripture, according to the first century. Yah possessed me. This is speaking of wisdom. The beginning of his ways as the first of his works of old. I was set up ages ago as the first before the earth ever was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs heavy with water. Before mountains were sunk, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth and the fields or the first dust of the word, world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he decreed a vault on the face of the deep. When he set the clouds above. When he had made the fountains of the deep strong. When he gave to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command. When he decreed the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him, a master workman. And I was his delight, day by day, rejoicing before him all the time. Rejoicing in the world, his earth and my delights were with the sons of men. We've already seen how Elohim created everything by his word. This perfectly matches up to what we've just read in John 1, right? In the beginning, the word was with Elohim and was Elohim. This has been equated to his wisdom. This is where the Targumis says, in wisdom, through wisdom, you are created. It, it matches up perfectly to this understanding of his word. Paul writes similar things. Speaking of Yeshua, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Remember what we read in Isaiah, that it's the word of the Lord that redeems. Who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation? Because in him were created all that are in the heavens and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulerships or principalities or authorities, all have been created through him and for him. He is before all and in him all hold together. By, what, what did we read? By my word I set the foundations, I created and hold everything together. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might become the one who is first in all. Because in him, all the completeness was pleased to dwell. Not some, all the completeness was pleased to dwell 
And through him to completely restore to favor all unto himself, whether on earth or in the heavens, having made peace through the blood of his stake. So everything matches up to the word. Is this Paul's not coming up with something new? Elohim, having of old spoken in the many portions and many ways to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all, through whom also he made the ages, who being the brightness of the esteem and the exact representation, not a a dim view, the exact representation of his substance, and sustaining all by the word of his power, having made a cleansing of our sins through himself, sat down at the right hand of the greatness on high. Hmm. He's spoken to us by his word. John just said that the word put on flesh. And Paul is simply going, he's confirming this with what he's writing. Are not Colossians and Hebrews describing the word that we've just covered an hour and a bit of doing? That they're not plucking this out of thin air. This is not this new doctrine. The, 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 the revelation is that the word put on flesh. That's the revelation. Okay, I'm going to... Yeah, this is, this is why I hit a, a sacred cow or two. I, I'm going to tick someone off. <laughs> Was the word, and by implication, Yeshua created? Well, I've already got mixed opinion here, but... difference between being created and brought forth um by the way this is one of the this question right here uh created a massive schism in the early church it was already infected by then but it split because of that question let's cover this you, you, I, i'm liking what i'm hearing if that's the case if the word and yeshua by implication is created i'm going to ask this does Yeshua receive worship? Yes. yes. Should he receive worship? Yes. yes. Okay. Should a created being receive worship? No. That's what, why myself being created, should I worship another created being? The angels are created and we're told not to bow down in front of them. Okay. Again, let's remember, I, I'm, gonna, I'm rehashing this for a reason. Remember how the word was understood by the Hebrews. The word, in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting in his power in the world of matter or mind, substitute for the Lord, purely to avoid anthropomorphic expressions. That's why they came up with the word. In the Targum, the Memra, the word figures as the manifestation of the divine power. Again, like the Shekhinah, the Memra is accordingly the manifestation of God. This is how John understood it. We've just covered, this is why I really laboured it, so that I'm not just kind of making this up. I want you guys to see it. The belief that Yeshua was created, therefore being distinct and subordinate to the Father, is called Arianism. That's where it's called Arianism. We'll cover this in a few parts down, but this theology was first attributed to Arius who lived 256 AD to 336. So this idea didn't actually really come around until the end of the third century. Interesting. We'll cover this in much greater detail further in the series. One of the parts will be to do with how the doctrines evolved, things like Trinity, dualism, monarchianism, modalism. We'll cover that. Okay, is the word Yah? Yes. Does Yah have a beginning? So how do we recon reconcile phrases like only brought forth son and firstborn of all creation, right? We've just read this. How do we reconcile this? 
Elo again, Elohim, infinite in nature, infinite in power, cannot fully manifest himself to a fallen world. He'll zap us, he'll fry us, right? Therefore, he manifests himself in a veiled or shrouded form, a dimmed version. Essentially, he is plugging himself in, if that helps you understand it. There's creation. I, I can't go in creation. I'm much greater than it. I'll plug myself in. Therefore, okay, is it so much that the word had a beginning or more that Yah's interaction with his creation began? Does that make sense? Is it that the word had a beginning or more that Yah's interaction with his creation began? Let's, uh, let's word it slightly differently. Is it that the word had a beginning or more that Yah began to manifest himself to his creation? Does that make sense? I'll try to word it slightly differently. So, Yah has no beginning. I am without beginning, without end, I will always be. But what began? That, that him manifest, he, so he creates us and then he manifests himself to us. That has a beginning. But does Yah have a beginning? Okay. Do you see that what I'm trying to get at? Okay. I am currently speaking to you. Right? I'm speaking to you all. My interaction with you has begun. But the source of this interaction was already there before the interaction, right? When I speak, I manifest myself through my words. They are born or come forth from me. My words are coming forth from me, right? And it's a manif manifestation of me. But I was already here. This is what I'm trying to say that Yah was always there, always has been, and then he created creation and then he manifested himself to it. It is I that is talking, no one else. My words is not another person running around doing its own thing, right? My words are me. My words are 100% me. Every word I speak is 100% me. My word is 100% me, but not 100% of me is my word. Does that make sense? So my words come forth from me, but I'm still here. My words are here. And I'm greater than my words. And my words are lesser than me. Why? Because they came... Does that make sense? So Yeshua is 100% Yah. He's the word of Yah, right? We know this. John says that. But not 100% of Yah is his word. I, this, oh, so, someone's going to go, ah, blasphemy. <laughs> no. Remember what we were saying. Yah manifested himself through... He, he shrouds himself, right? So that he can interact with us. There is more to Yah than just his word. That's what I'm saying. There's Yah, there's, there's his, we know of his spirit, right? It's the same to Yah and his spirit. We'll cover this more when we cover kind of the mechanics of Trinitarianism. But I, I'm going to say that the spirit is the same as the word. The spirit is 100% Yah, but there's more to Yah than just his spirit. The spirit is a, a way he interacts, right? He spoke creation into existence. His spirit hovered over the earth. It's through his spirit he communicates. If the word is a veiled or dimmed form of Yah, this explains why Yeshua can say, the Father is greater than I. The fact that he also came in flesh... Fully man explains why he had to pray to him. Because there was, if he's fully, I think I'll cover this in a second. Okay, so this is where we can actually get into debates over the mechanics of the relationship between Yah and his word. And believe me, they were doing it right at the beginning of, you know, the church. Such debates are futile. Why? And beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. The, it, it will say the mystery of godliness in the King James. Who was revealed in the flesh, declared right in spirit, was seen by the messengers, was proclaimed among nations, was believed on the world, was taken up in esteem. It's a mystery. It's a secret. In, if you read in the King James or other translation, it will say God who was revealed in the flesh. The earlier manuscripts don't actually say that. This is something that was kind of put in, but it's what, to me, it makes sense because was taken up into esteem. For someone to be taken up into esteem and beforehand having been revealed in the flesh, he had to be 
do you mean? It had to be higher before. Does that make sense? But the point I'm trying to make is the secret, the mystery, in Greek it says mysterion. The mystery of godliness, of reverence, is great. We, we read in 1 John, uh, we do not understand what he is now, but when we see him, we shall be as he is, and then we shall see him as he is, right? But they have to be separate. Look at the shadows we have, you know, like, there has to be a separation, and, you know, husband and wife are one. There's two, but they're, yet they're one. The other one is the woman came forth from the man. So the word came forth and there's a separation. A son comes forth from his father, on and on. Are these exact blueprints of divinity or shadows? Is Yah saying, this is exactly how it works, down to the T? Or is he showing, is it a shadow? Are they an exact schematic of divinity or do they show us what it is like? Just to help us understand it that little bit more. Look, we're talking about Yah. Therefore, I'll not really go too much on because one thing that I discovered as I was kind of hashing this out with Jez is that we will express the same idea differently and we think, and at first it seems like we're disagreeing, but it's like, hang on a minute, stand back. We're saying the same thing, we're just voicing it differently. John says that the word put on flesh, right? We, we read that. The word put on flesh became a man. This means that John is saying that Yeshua is the word. That's what he's saying. We have already ascertained that the word is Yah. If the word is Yah, then that means that Yeshua is Yah. Right? Then it's simple things. I'm not like... Do we actually find Yeshua saying and alluding to such things? We do. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. All I am, by the way, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. By the way, trace the good shepherd back to Ezekiel. All the stuff to do with the shepherd, that was Yah. Read it. It says Yah is going to be the shepherd. And Yeshua is saying, I'm the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. That, is, that was a bold statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Seven statements. Funny that, eh? All beginning with I am. Yeah. Thus, and he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Burning bush moment, right? And we covered that in part one. Who was in the burning bush? The messenger. But it's I am. Let's look at what Yeshua had to say, right? We claim to follow Yeshua. We claim he's our Messiah. Many people claim that. Let's see what our Messiah had to say. And he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. That, <laughs> let's take that on the pushat, I am from above. He's saying, I came from heaven. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you shall die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. He's having this with the Pharisees, by the way. And they said to him, who are you? And Yeshua said to them, all together, that which I even say to you. Basically, look, I'm t I've already told you. In verse 24, the word he is not in the Greek. So, the, read, the verse should read, Therefore I said to you that you shall die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. And then the Pharisees say, well, who are you? And he says, I've just told you. Why won't you get it through your thick skulls? That's huge. If you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. Changes it, doesn't it? It really does. Because people, I am he, oh yeah, I'm the Messiah. According to Yeshua, this is a salvation issue. I hate saying that it's a salvation issue. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Yeshua said it. Do you still want to follow Messiah? 
By the way, some, I've said this, but I'm going to say it up here. Now we start getting to the point where you're either going to make someone's faith in Yeshua stronger or you're going to demolish it. You'll see what I mean as this unfolds. First of all, Yeshua said that if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's... Let's keep going. Same, this is the same diatribe, by the way. So Yeshua said to them, when you lift up the son of Adam, then you shall know that I am he. Again, the he's inserted. You shall know that I am. When you lift... This, think about that. When you see the son of Adam lifted up, you shall know that I am and that I do none, of all, none at all of myself, but as my father taught me, these words I speak. As he was speaking these words, many believed in him. Many. Many. You know, people like to pick on the Jews, ah, oh, they killed Messiah. You know, actually, a lot believed in him. Hmm? My father taught me these words. So Yeshua said to those Yehudim who believed him, if you stay in my word, you truly are my taught ones. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are the seed of Abraham, and we have been, we have been servants to no one at any time, whilst they're under the bond of, bondage of Roman oppression. <laughs> How do you say you shall become free? I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him and said, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has spoken to you the truth which I heard from Elohim. Abraham did not do this. If you do the works of your father, then they said to him, we are not born of whoring. We have one father, Elohim. Yeshua said to them, if Elohim were your father, you would love me, for I came forth from Elohim, and I am here, for I have not come of my... This, I came forth from Elohim. He's saying, I'm, he's coming forth from him. I have not come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not know what I say? He's, he's saying it quite straightforward. Because you are unable to hear my words. You don't want to hear my words. You've hardened your heart. You are of your father, the devil, the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The Yehudim answered and said to him, Do we not say, well, you are a Shomeronite and have a demon? You're a, Samar a Samaritan. Yeshua answered, I do not have a demon, but I value my father and you do not value me. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone guards my word, he shall never see death at all. Again, another big, bold statement. The Yehudim said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets. You say, if anyone guards my word, he shall never taste death at all. You can understand why they're having this, uh, what's the word, um, when... Cognitive dissonance, thank you. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Whom do you make yourself? Yeshua answered, if I esteem myself, my esteem is none at all. It is my father who esteems me of whom you say that he is your Elohim. Your father Abraham was glad to see my, that he should see my day and he saw it and did rejoice. And the Yehudim therefore said to him, Are you not 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Please notice what he's done. You've got this thing, it happens, you bookend stuff. So he made the point right at the beginning, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And now he says on the other side, Truly, truly, before Abraham was, I am. And the whole bit in the middle, basically the bookends is the point you're trying to make. And everything in the middle explains that. And the whole bit in the middle is that you think you're of the seed of Abraham. And he says you're not. You're actually of, your de of the devil. All of this is bookended by who is Yah. 
Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Yeshua was hidden from, and went out from the set-apart place, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The Pharisees knew full well what he was saying, hence why they wanted to stone him. He just said, I am, that that's like blasphemy in their eyes. They knew fully well what he was saying. Again, do you follow Yeshua? Is he your Messiah? John 5, the man went away and told the Yehudim that it was Yeshua who made him well. And because of this, the Yehudim persecuted Yeshua and were seeking to kill him because he was doing these healings on the Sabbath. But Yeshua answered them and said, my father works until now and I work. Because of this then, the Yehudim were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he also called Elohim his own father, making himself equal to Elohim. The Pharisees knew what he was saying. Have you ever wondered why they didn't stone him sooner or kill him sooner? They didn't have the right. Because they were under Roman rule, the Roman emperor took the right for them to do um, uh, corporal punishment. That was saved for the Romans alone. They weren't allowed to condemn people to death. So when they stoned Stephen, they were actually going against Roman rule. This is why when the Pharisees got Yeshua, they didn't kill him themselves. They got Rome to do it. They weren't allowed. Anyway, little aside. John 10. So the Yehudim surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, say to us plainly. Yeshua answered them, I have told you and you do not believe. So first he's claiming that he is the Messiah. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness according to me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He's quoting Ezekiel. Go read Ezekiel and all the shepherd verses. And I give give them everlasting life and they shall by no means ever perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. He's saying I will give them everlasting life. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Again, the Yehudim picked up stones to stone him. Yeshua answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my father, because of which of these works do you stone me? The Yehudim answered him, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself Elohim. That's the accusation. Again, the Pharisees know what he's saying. John 17, I have esteemed you on the earth, having accomplished the work you have given me that I should do. And now esteem me with yourself, Father, with the esteem which I have had with you before the world was. Please esteem me with the esteem which I had with you before the world was. Again, what did we read? The word was with Elohim and was Elohim. John 18, Yehuda then, having received the company of soldiers and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. By the way, in previous, let's back up. Yeshua was saying he was there at the creation. That's what he's saying. He knew he was there. Yehuda, then having received the company of soldiers and officers from the chief priests of Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Yeshua then, knowing that all would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua said to them, I am. And Yehuda, who delivered him up, was also standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. I remember when I I was like, when was this verse put there? They fell down to the ground when he said, I am. Have a guess why. Once more he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua answered, I said to you that I am. If then you seek me, allow these to go. Why would saying your name make people fall to the floor? Unless that was the name. Finally, 
But Yeshua remained silent. So the high priest said to him, I put you to oath by the living Elohim that you say to us, if you are the Messiah, the son of Elohim. Yeshua said to him, you have said it. Besides, I say to you, from now on you shall see the son of Adam sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his garments, saying, He has blasphemed. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answering said, He is liable to death. Now, which bit of verse 64 was it that made him coming on the clouds? It wasn't the fact that he was Messiah that they called blasphemy. The phrase coming on the clouds was reserved to deity alone. He's saying that you will see the son of Adam coming on the clouds of heaven. The fact he's calling himself son of man. Go read the book of Daniel. I love how Mark puts this little account. It's, it's like an added little detail. But he remained silent, gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Yeshua said, I am. I like that, I am. And you shall see the son of Adam sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Again, same reaction. They te- he tears his garments. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they condemned him to be liable for death. John called Yeshua the word. The word was considered the veiled or dimmed manifestation of the eternal Elohim in our fallen world. Does that make sense? The word was considered Yah plugging himself in. Therefore, John was saying that Yeshua was Yah. That's simple logical steps. Yeshua equated himself to divinity, as we've just seen. Yeshua called himself I am over and over. The Pharisees fully understood what he was saying. Like, we, we miss this in the thing. Like, people don't want to say that Yeshua was just a man, completely. How do you read over this? What was he being accused of? Blasphemy. He made himself God. This is where someone's faith in Yeshua's Messiah is either strengthened or destroyed. Because if you believe that Yeshua was just a man, that's not what Messiah is saying. If you claim to follow Messiah, you have to, cl- you have to follow what he said. He didn't make himself just a man. We'll cover this. If you claim Yeshua to be the son of Elohim and the Messiah, you must accept what he said, taught and claimed. Right? That's that's the way it works. I follow you, I accept what you say, and I believe it, and I live my life by it. To say that he was not pre-existent is to go against his claims. He said, give me the esteem that I had before the world was. Right there he's claiming to be pre-existent, before creation. So you have to accept that if you claim Yeshua is your Messiah. You have to. It's to go against the understanding of what and who the word is. To say, to say Yeshua is just a man is to say that well, actually John's a liar when he said that the word put on flesh. That's what you're saying. Can you see why I'm saying this will either strengthen your faith or destroy it? This is actually can be a dangerous teaching. Okay, Yeshua, a man. Let, let's cover this quickly. I am not de- denying that Yeshua was a man. Right there, Yeshua was fully man. Fully man. I'm not denying that. <clears throat> the word became flesh. He didn't say the word became flesh, but still had his... De- he became a man and pitched his tent among us. I'm not denying that. This is part of the amazing revelation that... Y- Yah would actually do this. You know, Yah in all his glory, and basically he becomes a pitiful human being, prone to illness, has to go to the toilet and become ill. Did you see what I mean? It's literally like the, the, the human being becoming the amoeba. That's the equivalent. Hebrew says, so in every way he had to be made like his brothers in order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters related to Elohim to make atonement for the sins of his people. He had to become fully like us. For in what he suffered, himself being tried, he is able to help those who are tried. 
By this you know the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is of Elohim. By the way, what's this? if Yeshua was just a man and wasn't pre-existent, what's the, what's the point of this? I've come in the flesh. You've come in the flesh. We've all come in the flesh. That's not special. I'm sorry, guys. We're not special when we come in the flesh. What's so special about Yeshua coming in the flesh, right? And every spirit that does not confess Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. This is the spirit of anti-Messiah which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. This was going on in John's day. So what we've got here is nothing new. When Yeshua came, he was fully man. You cannot deny that. This actually explains why he had to pray to the Father. Right, for him to be fully on our level, do you have special access to the... Does anyone here have special access to Yah right now? Exactly. So for Yeshua to be on our level, this means he had to be separated. This is where the separation comes in. I'm not denying, but again the word put on flesh if it helps this is how I visualize it in my mind you have the big bucket of water and that's the eternal and he has the bucket cannot fit in our little existence so he pours himself into a glass and the glass goes in but the bucket is not depleted does that make sense there's still the same amount of water but the glass so there is that separation but it's Yah plugging himself in it's Yah, but there is that separation. But th- th- this is where we cannot fathom it. Pip uses the analogy of the candle lighting another candle, the big flame lighting the smaller flame. This is where we can argue and argue and bicker and divide. What we need to, this is where we need to really get down to the simple things of is Yeshua Yah in the flesh? Yes, he is. Did he become fully man? Yes, he did. How that works? <laughs> this is where the Jewish people were willing to leave the question mark. How is the word separate from Yah, but yet Yah, he's plugging himself in? That's the best way I can describe it. He's, dimming, he, he's making himself presentable to his creation so he doesn't kill us. I will not deny his pre-existence or him being the word and by extension the manifestation of Yah. This is where, you know, these are the, the, the basic things we need to accept. Yes, he's Yah. Yes, he fully became man. But he was, he is Yah. The rest is kind of split in heads, shall we say, right? I will also not claim that he was created as he is the manifestation of Yah in the flesh. What I will say is that Yah began to interact with his creation and that took on the form of the word. And then when, he became, when that word fully became man, it became a man. So as his interaction as a man began, does that make sense? Yah's interaction as a man began, but Yah was always there all along. This is what he claimed And this is what his disciples taught. That's what he claimed. To say otherwise is... is, Can you see why it will either make a faith or destroy it? We have to be... If you're intellectually honest with what Yeshua said and his disciples said, that's what it's saying. The belief that Yeshua was not pre-existent and was simply just a man is called adoptionism. Adoptionism states that Yeshua was just a man and was adopted or became the son of Elohim at his baptism, resurrection, or ascension. So there's three variations. But basically, he was just some dude, happened to not sin at all, and when he, either when he was baptized, resurrected, or ascended, that's when he became the son of God and adopted into Godhood. So it was lucky he got all the way to the baptism without sinning. Yeah, 30 years. I mean, fancy that. This is, what, this is where this comes from. And this doctrine did not come about until the end of the second century. That's just how it is. This doctrine is widespread in Messianic slash Torah movement. Widespread. 
We, we've encountered this very personally. The word was understood as a veiled, dimmed, or shrouded form of Elohim. It was how Yah, infinite in nature and power, manifested himself in a fallen and finite world. It's how he plugs himself in. It was how he could interact with his creation without destroying it. I like the analogy that Curtis gave to us of the man in the ant farm. You know, Yah is the man and we're the ants in the ant farm. And how does, I mean, have you tried picking up an ant? You, what happens? You usually end up killing it, right? So it is. Yah cannot interact with us directly. This is why, this is part of the amazing part of the gospel that we can actually become like the angels and like him that he may. This, when you start understanding this, I was just thinking, oh my goodness, the good news really is, like, it's, it's been really shaking me to the core, actually. It feels like I'm hearing it for the first time again. When you start meditating on this, that Yah, the infinite, came down to our level because he wanted to interact with you and bring you back unto him. The word is Yah. John stated that the word put on flesh and that it was Yeshua. By virtue of the word being Yah, this means that Yeshua is Yah. We saw that Yeshua made those claims. He didn't beat around the bush. We also saw that the Pharisees fully understood that he was making those claims. They got what he was saying. Do we believe Yeshua in his words? Again, I will ask you, do you believe in your Messiah and what he claimed? Do we believe what the disciples believed? This is what one disciple had to say. After eight days, his taught ones were again inside and Thomas with them. Yeshua came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Bring your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My master and my Elohim. My master and my God, Adonai, the Elohim Shali, he was saying, that's what they believed. Next week, we're going to cover what the disciples actually believed and why did they believe it. Where were they drawing this from? Which means we're going to be looking at some of the uh, Tanakh prophecies. What did the disciples believe and why? Because this is apparently what we claim to believe. Amen?